Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. We're back again, I'm Fari Borspuya. In this week's program we're going to be talking about religion and politics in sports and how ridiculous it is to the point of putting a towel over a man's head. And this week's interview is with Andrew Seidel, the Chief Attorney uh, of Freedom from Religion Foundation on constitutional rights and secularism and also our insane fatwa is how saying Merry Christmas Merry Christmas is the same or actually worse than murder and fornication and fornication and alcohol yes. and lots of other things and the slice of life is um, the fact that 222 deportations did not play, take place from Germany because pilots refused to fly Viva Pilots. Stay with us, don't go away. Now when sports and politics or religion mix, it's bad news. Because when you go to sports competitions, it's meant to be about sportsmanship yeah. or womanship and people yeah, just playing their best. Strategy, tactic, sort of training, all of that comes in, which is actually part of it's an ancient sort of activity and it's, yeah. it's, it's a brilliant thing to do, but yeah, when but religion gets involved... Bad news. And there's a couple of examples of this in the news which we'd want to talk about. And one is, of course, the Under-23 World Wrestling Championship in Poland, where the Iranian athlete Karimi Machioni, he was forced to throw a game yeah. with a Russian athlete. He was likely to win and they told him he shouldn't win because he'd have to then play with shock horror uh, or wrestle um, the Israeli athlete, which yeah. is absurd, isn't and, it? And when you, when you see the young man on uh, right in the middle of his game, it's been told, you must lose, you must lose, lose. And it's just like shocking for him. He turns around in disbelief. And the whole Islamic regime of Iran is sort of, they have a strategy of not playing with Israel. I yeah. mean, this is just like outrageous. And again, these are, you know, these are athletes, uh, whatever one's politics is on the issues, obviously it has no place in this uh, arena. And of course, lots of people in Iran are outraged that this has yeah. to happen, as is the wrestler and his coach and everyone. They're quite uncomfortable with the situation as it is. And we're seeing this throughout, aren't yeah, we? Yeah. Uh, there was the uh, draw for the World Cup um, as well, the FIFA World yeah, Cup, right, yeah. uh, where the Russian uh, co-host uh, uh, was being told to dress demurely so that it wouldn't be it would cut. Appease, appease the Islamic regime of Iran, or it wouldn't be censored in Iran. I mean, you know, even uh, you know the pressure to comply with the the most right wing religion in Middle East, uh, you know, everywhere actually, Islamic regime of Iran to to please a small number of uh, you know a reactionary uh, group of people who are in power in Iran. The whole scene it needs to change, and people need to, you know, be, people in Russia has got to sort of, but be careful how they how they're dressing. I mean, how, how could that be acceptable? <laughs> and and this seems to be okay. Is normal be respecting people's sort of culture. It isn't people's culture. That's the thing. Yeah, exactly. And of course, we see this, uh, especially with regards to the hijab. I don't know if you saw this uh, photo, which is the most hilarious photo on the face of the earth. And it is uh, for a game, Kabaddi Championship. And again, it's the women's championship. And it was, you know, I was like, what is Kabaddi? It's some sort of contact sport. And the a coach of the Thai women's groups that was playing the Iranian women's groups, she, he had to put a towel on his head first and then actually wear a headscarf. For, for, him, for him to be allowed to be sitting and watching his team compete. Yeah. I mean, this is <laughs> This is like na unnatural human behavior. <laughs> so, so they basically told him that he's not allowed, men are not allowed to watch it, but if he, because he's the coach and he has to be there, to he should pretend he's a woman <laughs> for the time being. <laughs> and it's the most hilarious thing and if you look at these photos and of course the coach says himself that they told him he had to do it and that he wasn't the only one. The sad part of it is that it's seeping through every aspect of people's social life you know from uh, from a sports to media to you know normal day to the activity and they put in pressure to undermine the structure of you know every civil and civilized element of human progress they want to undermine it completely step by step, 
and the thing is that we should stop this. And yeah, definitely. This. And the most hilarious thing of all this is that Time magazine has, uh, you know, uh, mentioned the 25 best inventions of 2017. And of course, there's some great inventions, you know, glasses where which allows the blind to see and a robot which can uh, uh, sense emotion. Mm -hmm. and, if, and, and one of the best inventions is the pro hijab, Nike's pro hijab. Oh, what the hell? This is it. I mean, you, you can see the ridiculous sort of nature of <laughs> nature of this. Hmm. Uh, Nike hijab is a part of human invention in 21st century. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's how could they? I that mean, the people who choose wrong. this in Time magazine who succumb to this, and Stupid. you know, they, I mean, what can you say to them? What can you say to these people who actually they should decide join to the accept fatwa campaign? They, they accept this sort of norm, which is yeah. you know unacceptable. I mean, they are legitimizing and normalizing, you know, the most oppressive elements and the backward elements in you know mm. in in today's world. Yeah. So I mean, and uh, uh, glasses that can help the blind see or the Nike Pro Hijab. Hmm. Really great invention of the 2017. Not. Welcome to Bread and Roses. I wanted to talk about the wonderful work you're doing at Freedom From Religion Foundation on legal issues. Can you explain some of the cases you're working on? Sure. So the Freedom From Religion Foundation works to keep state and church separate. That is our primary goal. And we do that through two avenues. We do that mostly we try to address violations through letter writing and education. You know, we try to resolve cases without having to go to court, if at all possible. So we will write a letter and educate the government and say, this is what the law says. You can't be, for instance, preaching in a public school. And if they ignore us, then we will go ahead and sue them. And we have a couple different lawsuits going on on issues like that right now. Well, some people might say, well, why can't they just do what they want to do? And if people want to pray and so on and so forth, what's the problem with that? Can you explain what the problem is? Sure. So I think the issue is the government and all the apparatus of the government, the machinery of the government belongs to everybody. And we live in a diverse, pluralistic society, and you can't have the government that belongs to we the people espousing one particular religion. And when it does that, it is violating the one inviolable right that we have under our Constitution, and that is the right to the freedom of thought. And that's, that's what our, really our First Amendment seeks to protect. Our First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. So it protects these six rights, a secular government, religion, free speech, free press, the right to petition your government and to get together. And really what those are trying to protect is the freedom of thought. And that is the one absolute right that we have under our Constitution. And when the government starts infringing on any of those rights, they are infringing your right to think freely. And that's not going to happen on our watch. Brilliant. So what are some of the uh, cases that you've won in, in the past year? Uh, one of the most rewarding that we won recently was we had a kindergartner and a first grader who came to our organization. So these are young children, five, six years old, and their teacher was lining the kids up against the wall and telling them to pray before lunch. And we explained to the school that this was illegal. They ignored us. We actually filed a lawsuit, and um, those teachers no longer work at the public school. Um, it was settled pretty quickly, and I mean, you can imagine the pressure that, you know, if you're a, a five or six year old and you're being told to pray, and all the other kids in your class are, are going along with it, how, how do you, at that point in your life, say no? You can't. You're not able to. So, it, you know, the pressure and the coercion there was just it was really nice to be able to cure and fix that violation. Really rewarding. And what about, I mean, do you find that there's a lot more of that going on now given the rise of the Christian right in this country and also with Trump being president? I think there is. I think there, I think there unfortunately, the religious right is far more emboldened than they have been and they're fighting battles that they previously would have considered losing battles. Um, including, just a good example of this, there was a cross in a public park um, in Florida. And the law on this is very, very clear. No court has ever allowed a cross in a public park to stand. 
and it got struck down by the court and then one of these religious right law groups came in and is appealing it and that never would have happened before Trump they wouldn't want to make this bad law but they're feeling very emboldened under the Supreme Court and under Trump so yes it's getting it's a little scary there's a lot of work for us to do but we're ready and why do you think you know drawing this line a line you know uh, and ensuring the separation remains why do you think that's so important for the society in general, apart from the freedom of thought issue that you were uh, talking about earlier? I mean, the wall of separation and that, that metaphor, the wall, you know, it speaks of a wall, not a fine line that's easily overstepped. That wall of separation is, is critical to progress. I mean, if religion controls your institution, re religion is the status quo and it needs the status quo to survive. So it works to enforce the status quo. And if you want progress, you need to keep it out of your institutions of thought and your institutions of government. And without, if you're not able to do that, you're not going to progress. It's certainly not at the rate that you should be. Um, so just general human progress, which Steven Pinker spoke at length about today at our convention, you, you need to keep religion at bay to be able to make that kind of progress. And that's what we're here to do. And I, I saw an interview you did on Fox News. <laughs> it was very funny, but uh, what, you know, the guy asked you how you feel about stopping little kids from enjoying the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say to that? I mean, we're n that's not what we are about. If, if a child or a parent wants to read the Bible with their child, they're free to do that. We are going to stop them from using the machinery of the state to get other people's children to read the Bible. It's, it's, again, it's the government that belongs to all of us. You don't get to use it to promote your personal religion. And that applies to everybody in a government office. You don't get to abuse that office to promote your personal religion. That's what we seek to stop. So what are the plans for the near future? Uh, we got a lot of work to do. Um, the, big, the big thing we're looking at right now is uh, the Johnson Amendment here in, in the United States, which allows, would, if it was eviscerated, which is the goal, would allow all political donations to flow through churches and we would have no idea how much money is coming in or out and allow those churches to endorse candidates which they're currently not allowed to do so that's one of the things we're working to protect and we've actually sued president trump to protect it already so can you explain the johnson amendment for people in iran for example who won't know sure. what it is and why it's so key to ensure that it doesn't get Sure. So what the Johnson Amendment says is that if you're a non-profit organization, you cannot engage in partisan politics. You can't endorse a candidate, and you can't say, nobody should vote for this candidate. And if you do that, you could lose your tax-exempt status. And that's, that is crucial because we want tax-exempt organizations and the donations that support them to go to that charitable work. We don't want it to be going to politics. And it's also critical because we have no way of knowing how much money goes into churches, because unlike other 501c3, those, under like other charities, churches don't have to report any of their funding. So it's a, it'll be a financial and informational black hole, and we're working very hard to stop that. Do you uh, worry about the effects of a Trump administration on this separation? Do you think that it's possible to uh, get rid of it uh, with various forms of legislation or other policies? Yes, I think, I think whatever is done by Trump can be undone. The, the harder thing to quantify is the disrespect that is being sown for the principle of the separation of state and church. And that's, that's the much harder thing to recover. All the legislation, all the policy changes, all the court cases, those can all be undone. But the fact that people are denigrating this, this core idea, you know, this is a uniquely American invention. Our, our country was the first to actually separate state and church. The idea was floating around in the ether of the Enlightenment, but we did it first. And instead of being proud of that fact, we're trying to tear it down. And so that's the harder thing that we're going to have to recover post-Trump, I think. As a final question, there is this contradiction, isn't it, that the U.S. has this strong separation, but the religion is so much part of society. So, so I actually don't think that's a contradiction. And James Madison, uh, one of our founding fathers, and Adam Smith, the famous economist, both predicted that that would happen. Because when you, when you get rid of the established theocracy, it forces religions to compete for followers. So it actually fosters this marketplace of religions, uh, making them much more competitive and much stronger. Uh, so it, it actually, it's, it seems like this paradox, but it actually is what you would expect to see in a country with a well-disestablished church.
Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, Lebanese cleric, his name is Abu Musab Wajd Akar. And as you know, he's got a very long name, which means what? A very stupid? Fatwa. Exactly. And he said... Uh, You'll never believe it, but he said that if you say Merry Christmas, it's actually worse than killing someone. Hmm. And uh, Merry worse Christmas. than Merry fornication Christmas. or, you know, drinking, drinking alcohol, alcohol and, and murder. And, and because they're all the same thing. Merry Christmas, drinking alcohol, fornication can be quite yeah, nice. Yeah. Or murdering someone, which is obviously So what's his justification for good. saying this? Well, he says because you're saying that someone who believes in Christianity and the heresy of, you know, December 25th being Jesus' birthday and Jesus being another God or the Son of God or whatever. This is competition it's between imaginary heresy. friends. So your imaginary friend is not good, uh, as good as mine. If you believe in, believe in yours... It's, it's worse, than, worse murder. than murder. But, you know, he, he goes into a lot of explanation, and you should know this too, because it's important to know these things. And he says, even if an alien comes, and, you know, he says, the alien says Merry Christmas to you, because the alien will know that it's Christmas, you shouldn't reply back, because even if you'll never see the alien again, and even if he leaves back to his own planet, and nobody knows that he said Merry Christmas to you and you've said Merry Christmas to him. Still, it's worse than murder and fornication see, and alcohol. You see what we're dealing with here? And these guys are in power in many places. Hmm. So, Crazy. that just leaves us to say Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Two hundred and twenty-two deportations have been stopped uh, in Germany. A new report shows because pilots have refused to take the deportee who said they don't want to go back to their home country because they're fearful for their lives. Well, and that's really wonderful, absolutely. isn't it? And this is being brought to attention of everybody, and this is something to celebrate. Although this has happened before, many pilots refuse rightly to uh, uh, carry. People who have been deported, uh, deported to dangerous uh, countries, usually Islamic within countries. In this case, uh, many were uh, deported to Afghanistan. The German government thinks it's a safe place mm, uh, for people sad. to be returned. So this is really something to celebrate. And I think um, this needs to continue. And people, all the pilots everywhere, should refuse to take deportees back to the country of origin. Yeah, I mean, I think this should be something that should become the norm, yes. shouldn't it? I mean, it's very similar to, uh, for example, the outrage we feel today when we hear about Jews being sent back to Nazi Germany, for example, or to places where the Nazis were in control and killing people um, in, in droves. The yeah. same thing is happening now in many countries. But it's acceptable now for people to yeah. be deported back there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think, I think that, that's something great and we need to celebrate it. So well done to the pilots in Germany and many other countries Keep it up, who, yeah. who are refusing to, uh, you know... Yeah, and, I'll be flying more Lufthansa yeah. on your wings now because that's some of the pilots. <laughs> that, well done, guys. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we've reached the end of our program. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again at the same place and same time next week. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. 
We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.